We made this. Welcome to Ask Us About Loom, the point and click adventure game podcast only on the We Made This Podcast Network. But as always, we don't usually t- we don't always talk about point and click adventure games. We are talking about other interesting kind of narrative or interactive stories as well. I am Matt, I am Matt Latham, your host, your master of ceremonies, and I'm here again with a special episode um, to tide over until hopefully we get a second season. Well, hopefully we will be getting a second season at the end of this season at the end of this year and with me yet again is my uh is my fellow kind of narrative game connoisseur ian buckley back on again how you doing Ian? i'm doing well good talking to you yeah you must be enjoying it you're back again for i think the <laughs> third or fourth time is it the third I think? yeah we did return of monkey island and, and we did gone um, home gone home thank you yeah yeah and i know there's a couple of games that you want to come back to talk about including one that i've not played but might be well the title. L- L- loom itself yes, <laughs> yes yeah we've, yes. we've talked many times <laughs> yes. about hey you've got this podcast say it called ask, ask me about loom and i'm someone you can actually ask about loom because i played the shit out of that as a kid yeah i've not i think i've only played it half an hour of it but um i think i might yeah i might save i think i might save that one until people start asking me when's the loom episode so yeah <laughs> yeah yeah people listening tell people about this podcast right the more people that ask me about me playing loom eventually i might go yeah it's time for the episode but yeah um, it's got to be so. more than just me asking matt <laughs> hey how about we play loom <laughs> yes 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 so uh crowd so- crowdsource enthusiasm that's what i'll call it but um we're not here to talk about loom we're here to talk about another game a game which is actually was actually my favorite game of last year i i, I brought it up quite a few times over that i mentioned it during the return of monkey island monkey island return of monkey island was my second favorite of last year, I think it was your favourite, um, and then me talking about this game basically got you to play it, and you went, "Yeah, I'll come on to talk about this game." So, Ian, why don't you tell everyone the game that technically I've picked? <laughs> <Let's talk about laughs> yeah, so we're talking about the game Immortality, and this was a game that, yeah, like you said, you uh, had been aware of coming up. You had played the creator's previous games, which I had not; I'd only heard of them. And you were really excited for this game. It came out. You were talking talking it up, and I said, "All right, you know, I'll I'll check it out." And I did, and I loved it. I had a great time with it. Yes, yes. Immortality came out on uh, the end of August of last year uh, on the Windows and Xbox. Um, I think it's on Game Pass as well. Um, it's also on mobile on mobile as well. Immortality is the I think the third interactive film video game developed by Sam Barlow, um, published by Half Moon Productions. And yeah, it's, we'll, we'll come to the discussion about whether it's a game in a second, but as always, um, me and Ian are going to perhaps talk about it in non-spoilery terms. Um, so if anyone's not listened or not played to, um, this game yet um we're gonna try and just advertise what it's about and if you like it go and play it and then once we hit the threshold of spoilers we're gonna to go to town on this and from the get-go i'm just gonna say that this game has the more that you do not know about this game the more you're gonna get out of it so we're gonna be very tr- we're gonna be very tiptoey about what we say about the game and just try and give you enough to about how it works and briefly what it's about and then yeah then i'll then we'll open the floodgates so um yeah so basically the game is set is based on a fictional model turned actress called marissa marcel who starred in three films in 1968, 1970, and 1999, but n- none of them were ever released. And Marissa Marcel has since gone missing. And basically the aim of the game is that you are flicking through raw footage from these three films, from these three dif- distinctive eras, trying to piece together what happened to Marissa Marcel, what happened to these movies, why they didn't finish. And and they they're in the form of 
basically dailies or just uncut film reels. So you've you've not just got the shots from the films, you've got um, behind the scenes footage, you've got interviews, you've got cast read throughs, you've got rehearsals, um, enough to gauge, <laughs> enough to gauge, pun intended, um, what happened. And yeah, and that, that's pretty much the gist of the game. Um, I can't think of anything else to say without spoiling it. Yeah, it's a mystery game. You're essentially being presented with very little prompt, you know. Part of the game, part of the pleasure of the game is discovering how to play it and what to do in the first place. You're given very little in the way of instruction or prompting. You're just presented with a series of clips which are sourced from, like you said, some are from the actual dailies of these fictional films that are uh, that our fictional star of this game has, has starred in. And some of them are clips from rehearsals, from auditions, and from, yeah, some behind-the-scenes footage as well. And your task as the player is essentially to explore each of these clips, discover new things about what's going on in these clips, and find links to other clips. So you will explore, for example, what goes on in this particular scene from this movie that this actress Marissa was starring in. And you might pause the clip and you might look at the vase of flowers that are on this table over here. And you'll hover your mouse over that vase of flowers and the icon will change, will change and you click on that vase of flowers. And all of a sudden you're in a new clip and it could be one that you've already seen, or especially early on in the game, it'll most likely be one that you've never seen before. It'll be an entirely new clip. And the starting point of that clip will be maybe there's a flower on uh, another table or there's a flower that someone's wearing or there's a painting of a vase of flowers in that scene that it links to. Whatever the connection is, the game makes it for you and then it's the player's task to continue to make these connections, unlocking more and more and more of the story until they unravel the mysteries involved. Yeah, exactly. It's the match cut uh, te- uh, system, I think the game refers to it as, where you'll just click on something and it'll randomly go to uh, an- another clip with that thing. Um, so if you match cut, I don't know, like a set of keys, it'll go to another film and zoom out with a key or something or if you click on an actor or an actress so for example if you click on marissa's face um you'll go to another screen another scene with marissa in um and as you can as you can gather that'll get that'll get you quite a lot of them um that'll get you quite a lot of them and it's that's just pretty much how you kind of move through and we'll we'll talk about other aspects of the game of the gameplay after the spoiler bits um but I think one I think one of the things I think that might also appeal to people is that if you're not much of a gamer but you are a film fan, there's a lot of there's a there's a very strong kind of tribute to the golden age of cinema as well as kind of like and like hints to other like directors in like the last twenty years as well. So there's a nice kind there's if you've always been a fan of that kind of like late sixties, early seventies era of film, you're gonna get a lot of out of this as well. Um there's not there's been i think there's a lot of area of authenticity with it so um there are the three films that you get in the game you've got ambrosio minsky and the two everything um sam barlow who's the writer of the game who created telling lies and her story um he he brought in professional screenwriters uh to to separately write scripts for these films so you've got amelia gray who has worked on um who's worked on Mr. Robot and Maniac, who, who did uh, one of them, I can't remember which one, um, Alan Scott, um, who also wrote one of them as well. And Alan Scott is someone who has done things. Uh, Alan Scott wrote Minsky, um, so he's worked on The Queen's Gambit, for example, for Netflix, as well as an assortment of all the different, ga- different films that we're going to go through, including Don't Look Now um, from the 70s. So if you've ever seen that um, photo or meme of Donald Sutherland looking, pointing and looking scared, he wrote that film. And finally, Ga- um, Barry Guilford was another one, uh, another writer, uh, an American writer who has wrote, written so many different novels and 
stories and poems and stuff, but also wrote things like City of Ghosts, uh, Lost Highway, um, uh, basically who, which was written with David Lynch, which we'll come, we'll come which we'll, uh, we'll come back to a bit later on. Um, so yeah, so he's man, so he, he's gotten, he wants, he's gotten an air of authenticity with kind of actual screenwriters to help write the in-universe films as well so absolutely yeah you make a great point there is a stigma that i think full motion video or live video kind of games have um because it harkens back to when that was when that was first coming out and it was it was the rage and uh the acting was generally speaking poor the video quality was poor the level of interactivity was poor all of that is out the window with this game. The level of interactivity is high. Like it, 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 like you mentioned, it actively uses some of these sorts of like, you know, editing or film nerdy or like attention to details kind of kind of skills. Like it's almost like an image search on each of these of these clips. And there's there, there's more to each of these clips that that we're not going to get into right now, which we'll get into when we get into spoilers. But there's a lot going on kind of under the surface here. It's a lot more sophisticated than those full motion video games of the past. And the acting, the writing is all noticeably for me, at least, because I do remember some of those games from the 90s much, much, much higher than anything I was expecting out of a quote unquote full motion video game. Uh, in 2023 and that is kind of what i had heard about barlow's previous games is that hey this is this is a a game creator who is actually doing this right who is doing this well who's getting actual like not that game writers aren't real writers but that are getting writers with with actual hollywood experience um recent quality hollywood experience to come in consult to write getting quality performers to give layered performances uh and yeah he's clearly interested in creating that kind of like verisimilitude with the eras in which these clips are set like you've got these two movies from the late 60s and from 1970 that are clearly intended to feel like movies from that era and then you've got a third film from 1999 is the era in which it's set is it's set and it's a much more digital looking it's a much it, it it looks much more and is styled much more like a film of that era so they do a good job of not making this look like a low rent production exactly yeah and um i think full motion video games have come on heaps and bounds in the last decade i think as the technological advances to be able to be well one to be able to process hd video 1080p video for example to make things not look like you're staring at a very blurry little tiny section on a mega cd game so we're not into the era of night trap or uh, night trap where it feels like the ambition behind games such as wing commander 4 where you had mark hamill <clears throat> appearing in a uh, space shooter um like it feels like the it's it's here it's it's done it's it's here and everything um in terms of the history in terms of the history of the game itself so i'm quite familiar with sam barlow's kind of full motion video work um so he's kind of so he's like third proper like director game he's worked on other games in the past he's worked on, he's been the lead designer of two silent hill games so he's worked on silent hill origins and shattered memories as kind of the lead as the writer and the lead designer of those games. But um, I think the full creative control has been with him on these three games. Um, her story is, I think, I remember being absolutely blown away by that in the simplicity of that. Um, for I know you've not played it yet, but all that, that is basically you've got a bunch of clips and you're typing in, into a search engine pieces of dialogue and getting clips of this woman who's been interviewed by police and you've got seven day and you've got like seven days of interviews and you're trying to work it and you and it's she's been interviewed about the death of her husband and um very similar to immortality and telling lies of the game you've got non-linear narratives trying to piece together so everyone's playthrough is going to be very different telling lies is very similar um it's her story with a much bigger budget only this time you've got four people you've got four people you're flicking through um and the the scale and the the topics it follows is a lot grander and a lot more epic if 
if perhaps I'm not, I wasn't much a fan of telling lies as her story. I think what that telling lies down is that the video clips can go to, can go from thirty seconds to eight minutes, and you're fast forwarding and flicking through. Um, whereas Immortality sometimes has longer clips. It does. It never feels as if you're watch your waning and stuff um so i'm coming into immortality having loved her story being lukewarm about telling lies and um but hearing about immortality i was a lot more excited about this because i feel like it's something different to telling lies was so i was so that's my kind of history san barlow and you you're complete this is your first san barlow game wasn't it Absolutely. I had heard of her story, heard a lot of great things, hadn't played it. Um, I don't think I I probably heard uh, about Telling Lies when it came out. Definitely didn't have the same amount of buzz and acclaim as her story did. So it's probably why it wasn't on my radar as much. And then this one wasn't at all before it came out. And then you were talking it up and I looked into it and I thought, you know, like, I'm a movie nerd. This sounds like it's up my alley. And I heard great things about her story. And this is the same guy. I'll give it a try. And I'm really glad I did. Like, that, you know, if nothing else, I do want this to serve as a, if if even a little bit of what we've talked about so far sounds like it might be up your alley. Just pause this. Go play it for four or five hours come back, listen to the rest. You know, it's uh, not that that's how long it takes to finish the game, but uh, I mean, it it could, if you're really like just trying to cram the quote unquote story and you're just, you're just grinding through clips. Like you could probably hit the credits in five hours, but there are, you know, over 200 uh, clips to explore through this gameplay. So there is a lot to discover. You know, I played a ton and I still have only, you know, we were just talking about this before we recorded. I've unlocked 16 out of 27 Steam achievements. You, my friend, have unlocked 26 out of 17. But like, you know, you've, you've gotten 202 clips. I've gotten 176. So like, I've got, I've got still work yet to do. Um, and, and that's an exciting thing about this game too. Yeah, I, I've clocked about 14 hours overall. Um, it, 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 t- it took about five to six hours to get to the ending. But then as with previous games, you can, uh, previous some other games, you can then go back to catch the stuff that you have, you've missed. So there's plenty of stuff here. Um, and I think before we go to the spoilery zone, um, I remember the one thing that I, that I was kind of, unsure about which kind of because i remember thinking oh i want to buy this game but i don't know because i don't know if i want to because it's been advertised as a horror um and as someone i'm not much a horror fan um mainly gory and grisly horror um and trying to say this without spoiling anything there are horror aspects but if you're someone who doesn't like jump scares i i hate jump scares i will i will not watch something with jump scares in it there really isn't anything of that nature in this. There's a lot. Of, so there's psychological and psychological aspects to this. Um, and within the, and a lot of the horror is in the actual narratives of the films that being recorded in there. Um, and other than that, if you're okay with the stuff that happens in game, then other things you'll be fine with other things. It's not, it's not an over out. It's not a sensationalist out to try and get you to jump and cack yourself type of game. So yeah, I think that's fair. I, I think that's fair. I think I don't think I've spoiled anything by saying that. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll, I'll go a step farther and just say like, look, if, if you have been avoiding this game because you don't want to be scared, don't, there's nothing, that is quote unquote scary at any point in the game. There are some unsettling. Yes. I was just going to say there are some unsettling images, some unsettling concepts, um, certainly some unsettling activities that are portrayed within these films, within films like the first movie is about like the devil and temptation and there's some sex and blood and murder. Like there's, there's some of that in terms of subject matter, but none of it is framed in a way that is meant to frighten or disgust or horrify the audience on a sort of visceral level by what's being presented on screen. And the other stories are even less frightening. So I, if, if anyone is, t- is a little worried on that front, I would say definitely don't be. 
Um, there are some, you know, some of the layers beneath what's happening in these clips. Um, there are some like uh, moments of revelation that can be a little, ooh, that took me by surprise, but nothing that is going to have you jumping out your seat and nothing that is gory or, or, or violent um, in any kind of over the top way. Yeah, no, yeah, that's completely agree with that. And I think, I think we're now at the point where we can put, draw a line and start talking about the game, the game in full spoiler mode. So yeah, so I'm going to, so what's going to happen? I'm going to play the, the, I'm going to play the little musical indents that I now have to transition to this. So Ian, I'll see you on the other side. Hey, 11 months I've been waiting for <laughs> to talk about this game in full exploratory, exploratory detail. So, and <laughs> it's also one of those kind of games where there's at least, there's three layers of story going on. And I'm re- yeah, and I'm, str- and I'm struggling to figure out where to start with first. But I think, because I think there's a lot to unpack with how densely layered the story is. Um, so I think... I think one of the first things I think that jumps out is the kind of is the interesting story, not underneath, but the kind of real layer, the real, the, the behind the scenes layer of what happened to Marissa Marcel and the kind of politics between that, where you've got this um, unknown starlet appear from kind of France with a perfect like an American accent turn up, get get introduced, get, get put into this kind of Hitchcock style horror film fall in love with um the director of photography and then become involved something tragic happens and then comes back like 30 years later um and there's a, there's 30 years later to kind of help this uh, to kind of bring to to help the quote-unquote friend director that's this turns up there's a, uh, and within that way you've kind of got the kind of traditional kind of almost sexy sexy attitudes of 1960s cinema the progressive nature aggressive nature within the 70s and then a very more interesting kind of stuff that happens in the 90s and um, what was your so what was your what's your initial thoughts on that layer of story when you first played it yes so i enjoyed the kind of basic surface level story that I was getting through exploring and unlocking all these clips, getting a sense of this person's career as they dip their toes in the water of kind of a more classic, you know, the tail end of a kind of classic Hollywood, uh, you know, in the, in the late sixties with an established legendary director, you know, trying to tr- trying to like pump out like one final masterpiece and she kind of has her breakout role. And that, that movie actually, I believe in the lore of the game does get completed. That's the one that gets finished and, and kind of starts her properly starts her career. But That's it never, the film. cause I think it never, it never was released because the director and um, the director character, Arthur Fisher steals the, the film reels. Right. There is yeah. something that happens to the film and not necessarily to anyone during filming. Um, there's no onset tragedy. It's just that this never sees the light of day. Ultimately, the I think the reasons for that is I think because Marissa Marcel, Marissa Marcel, starts getting very confident in herself um, and starts a relationship with the director of photography. Yeah. And the, the DP Dundry. basically starts directing uh, like his own scenes, and yes. he and the star Marissa basically decide and you can see this evolution as the this is what we're talking about that all the different layers of story you can see how this evolves over the course of filming because you have all the clips going all the way back to auditions for this movie all the way through to the you know se- you know behind the scenes celebration of we've wrapped filming congratulations everyone and we get to see All that journey in between those two points, including this developing relationship with the director of photography. And you can see in some of these scenes where the the director of the whole movie is like, hey, guys, I'm not I'm not okay with where this scene is going. Let's talk this over. And the the two of them are basically like, nah, no, let's just shoot it. And they kind of hijack the film from him. And you can you can explore that story in real time as well. And then you have, yes, that director goes on, the director of photography rather goes on to direct his own feature, which she stars in. And you get to see 
all, you know, how that project ultimately results in the tragic death of one of her co-stars. And you get to, again, you get to see all of this happening. You don't know exactly why this film didn't work out either. And then you get to the scene where you see the doc, the, the guy get shot in the chest and it's like, oh, oh, it was the Brandon Lee situation. Like someone got killed with an onset gun and, and, you know, instead of them finishing the movie, like the, the whole thing collapses. And then, very interestingly, you get this third movie, which takes place in 1999. And your first clue that, like, huh, something's a little weird here is that the actress looks like she's the exact same age. It's 29 years later, and the actress appears to be the exact the exact same age as she was in 1970. And that's when you and that's when at least I realize, huh, something weird is going on here. Yeah, I mean. I don't have many complaints about this game whatsoever. Um, perhaps apart from perhaps my own personal journey of it. I think in universe, the only thing that perhaps was like a bit hmm, about is that no one ever calls out, Oh, Marissa Marcel, who must be at least in her late fifties. He's playing someone 25 years old. So the question I have is, is she still, is the actress still going by Marissa in 1999? Yeah, yes, it's, yeah, okay. it's still Marissa I'd Marcel. For, I'd, I'd, for, I'd forgotten that part. Okay. Yeah, so she's Marissa Marcel. So the idea being, oh, she come back, comes back in, but she looks exactly the same as she did in the 1970, just with, just with increasingly interesting wigs. <laughs> the wig, <laughs> the wig game is amazing on this. If you're a fan of kind of interesting wigs, you're going to have a massive die with this. Um, yeah. So yeah, and then the the film, so the the third film, um, which is filming in nineteen ninety nine, um, that suddenly just stops. That suddenly just stops um, filming. Because, something something happens to her. Uh, it, yeah. You know, it, whereas in these previous two films, the first one gets finished but never sees the light of day. The second one is almost finished. The co star dies, and then this third one, she she dies i mean you know we're we're talking spoilers but like something happens to her uh she she reaches the end of her journey at least the end of one of one part of her journey throughout all this the gameplay itself kind of has the ability to go forward and backwards through these film reels so um the idea being is that and I played this on PC, so I was using a keyboard, whereas everyone was saying, oh, if you're playing it on Xbox, use a controller because it's better with a controller because the amount of speed that you use on the triggers will increase the speed and slow down and everything, um, which kind of makes sense because what, you, what happens is um, sometimes you will hear this kind of low buzzing sound or if you're playing on a controller, the controller will vibrate. And then if you stop, start rewinding, Things start to happen and you start to see these weird kind of out of context changes start to appear. And, um, yeah, um, so what was your first, what was, what was your first instance? Can you remember the first one that you experienced? Yes, very distinctly. Um, so I, I, you know, I, I can't reference the exact clip number or whatever, but it is in the, you know, the 99, uh, film sequence. It's in the scene where she is going to sing the sort of Marilyn Monroe style, kind of like happy birthday song. Um, and that, the 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 her singing at the microphone um was where i i went back for the first time and the 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 muse you know the 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 immortal character um popped up and i was like what is happening what is actually happening right now um and that was for me the key into because like for me at that point i had just been kind of like going clip after clip after clip you know really enjoying my time but exploring the more surface level story and in the back of my mind i think i had i had heard like you maybe say you know like keep going because when the real story reveals itself it's you know like there's more to this game and you know it's it's certainly not like i was losing interest or anything but you were absolutely right when that extra layer revealed itself it was like Oh, now I have to go back to every clip I just unlocked and find more. 
inside inside these clips that I've already thought I had thoroughly explored. Yeah. 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 Um, and I think, and my experience was that I think I kind of, I was watching, I was kind of watching a little Twitch, Twitch screen, a Twitch stream just before buying it. Cause I was kind of unsure. I was still unsure about how hor- horror it was. And when I started watching, um, someone was saying, Oh, we started playing it. And we found that if you rewind something, so something happens when you rewind. I'm like, oh, okay. And I stopped and I was like, okay, I'll buy the game there. <laughs> I'll buy the game. So I was kind of aware of that bit first, but I wasn't sure about how you did it. Um, and my first clip of that that happened was when it was two of everything. So it was a 1999 one. And it's the scene where the kind of, there's a rehearsal scene where they, I can't remember where in the film it is, but the narrative of the film the narrative of that film there's a, there's a scene and we'll, we'll get into this the the film narratives in a second um and how they relate to the third the the under under layer um there's a scene where the character where the where the character that marissa marcel plays um gets attacked she shoots and she kind of like shoots uh or aims a gun at someone um and there's there's a bit where she's aiming the gun and then there's a noise and when you go back suddenly she changes to a completely different person. And when that happened the first time, that's probably one of the few times I was like, ooh, the closest to a jump scare. I was like, what the, what the hell? Ex- exactly. Cause you get the noise too. And then all of a sudden there's a sudden transition. And like mine, the transition happened during a close up because she's, you know, singing the song and she's in close up of the microphone. And then all of a sudden she's someone else. And it's, yeah, it's a little startling at first. Yeah. Um, and I was like, ooh, okay. And then, and then kind of um like it goes oh okay so and then trying to figure out how how i did that and then realizing that there's that like low noise going vroom, that happens so we're winding through all them getting all these clips and going oh yeah okay yeah this is interesting and this is interesting but it's very very open and the end the end of the game happened and i'm looking at all these things i'm going like oh okay yeah i'm enjoying this game i quite like the concept but i don't know it's too vague and too open for me to kind of think it's better than her story and then i remember and i started and after after about five six hours i started reading i started reading kind of think pieces on the actual story because i was quite interested to get in other people's viewpoints because i was like oh okay i've got i must have gotten about most of this now and people started mentioning some clip story i did or details that I missed. I'm like, where did you get these from? And there's a key aspect of that, key aspect of the gameplay is that you've got two kinds of rewinding. You've got the kind of reverse rewinding for the sounds, but then after about, after you've watched about three or four of those um, kind of jump cut, jump cut things, there are, you'll start to see overlays appear where this mysterious kind of blonde woman who we who, who will become to known as the one and um appears and what i never realized is that you have to stop and use the frame back on those and then if you hold it you then you kind of have to kind of guide the reversing into that and yeah. and, and then, then a new clip plays essentially from that point yeah, forward yeah because if you try and you, if you try and go rewind backwards like you do with the other ones on that you can't trigger those and i'm like and as soon as i started finding those frame skip ones there's at least 70 odd little tiny ones in that and it started filling out a lot the story and the lore and i was like holy crap and then as i started figuring out the stuff that's happened and and a lot of the missing information that i thought was too vague came out i was like holy crap this is amazing (laughs) Yeah, so in about a third of these clips that you unlock, there are these other full clips within these clips that give you the whole background story of these immortal characters. I mean, it's it's all kind of vague, like it is. It's not like very specific laid out, like this is exactly what's happening. But you get the general sense um, from watching all of these clips of this... this um, under this this deeper layer of story and lore that's been going on for centuries or millennia basically as the the true nature of this um story reveals itself you've got the one and the other you've got these two kind of immortal beings who they who take the form of humans and just live their lives and then transfers and transfers themselves although um sometimes the the memories and the personalities of who they 
inhabit kind of move on from house to house it's so the idea being is that if someone dies the these kind of immortal beings can take over or can like take over and take their form continue on as them continue on as them and you've got two of them you've got this kind of very ambivalent he doesn't really care about humanity and you've got argue and you've got the arguably the main character who's actually not played by who <laughs> played by charlotte maheen is it maleen Ma- Marlin, I think it's pronounced. Charlotte Mo- Marlin. Marlin, I think. I apologise if I mispronounced that. But basically, she plays the one who is actually taking the, the form of Marissa Marcel. And basically, every time you see Marissa on screen, it's actually not Marissa Marcel. It's not Marissa Marcel, the person. It's this being who's taken over Marissa Marcel. And then and it, it, these hidden clips reveal... The, the, that the things that happen behind the scenes have another layer of things that are happening underneath. So during the night, during Ambrosio, which is the 1968 film, um, you've got the one who's first, first appears on set as Marissa Marcel being, um, like introducing because she's always been fascinated with storytelling and everything and the nature of acting or performance and, yeah, my my read on her is that she's basically a muse. Yes, she's, you know she's this immortal sort of creative being that is drawn to all of those creative energies and to the folks who are who are tied up into that in in that life. And the other one is, like you said, much more ambivalent about these sorts of things. She's just sort of. And at a certain point, it seems like maybe he was more interested in it and he sort of become disillusioned or become more, you know, more disinterested over time. He kind of like doesn't get what her fixation is, but she's still very much, um, you know, on the humanity train, creative energy train. And, you know, at, at the end, it's a little I mean, do you want to get to what happens at the end with this character? And it's a little bit vague in in terms of what ultimately will end up happening. We'll um, get to that in a second. I think. We, yeah. Yeah. Let's, if we let's continue chronology, chronology, sure. chronology first. Uh, Go for it. So, yeah. So, um, yeah. But I think it's so the relationship that develops between Marissa Marcel and John Durick, who's the director of photography. I think you used to begin to learn that the one's fascination with creativity, she gets drawn and I think almost, I think falls for Durick, um, the director of photography. And I think her powers or something i think she just encourages kind of like the dormant creative side because i think during the ambrosio story john jurek has visions of being a director but he doesn't really have the drive or the support or to go to go to that level and i think it's and i think being drawn to marissa slash the one i think encourages his creativity which almost hijacks ambrosio which causes fisher to Bug off, bug, like buzzy bugger off. Um, so when in 1970, what happens is then you come, you create Minsky's be, being developed, which is about the artist is about an artist that gets murdered. And that artist muse is a woman called Miss Minsky is the lead suspect and gets involved with, um, and there's this kind of very conservative salt of the earth, salt of the earth detect, young detective, um, kind of like young detective who gets involved in with this with this um muse and this muse kind of like drags him into this kind of bohemian progressive lifestyle which he's at odds with um which mar- which parallels the relationship between the one and jury because i think it's at a certain point at a certain point we find that the a- the actor playing the police officer is actually the other um, is the other is the other muse um, just basically going around keeping an eye on the one? Uh, I apologise if this is getting confusing, if, but I'm assuming if you listen to this, you've played it, so you know what I'm on about. Um, and, I sure hope so because we're getting <laughs> deep into spoilers. Oh god, yeah. If you if you've not if you've yeah, I, we've just ruined it for you anyway. Um, but I think but the kind of like idea being is that he's trying to actively disrupt the one's ideas of love of like love and storytelling and being creativity and embracing that creativity and i think during the and i think during the uh filming um you have the onset accident where you find 
I was at accident where the actor playing this police officer gets shot. But what you then find if you start reversing the film, and it's one of the, it's one of the, I think only two or three times where you can also reverse reverse footage because it adds extra layers of what's actually going on. It's, you learn that the, you actually learn that the, um, the shooting was deliberate. So she actually killed the set, the person on set because it was actually, because he, she was trying to kill the other one. Yeah. And, and then if you, if you go further as well, and this took me ages to find, you go further in reverse, you actually find that there's someone watching who's found these film reels and watching the film reels who becomes a co-star in the nineties. <laughs> but uh, we'll get to that in a second. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, this is very thought confusing, but, but then I think also the one reveals her true nature to Jurek and Jurek freaks out and she ends up killing him and then taking his form. Um, taking his form and uses and then uses the the shooting of Carl Greenwood to say basically to basically make Marissa and Marcel a recluse whilst the one then goes becomes John Jurick and then has a 30 year successful career as a film director so the implication being is that the one now is yeah he like based out yeah and he's embraced this person so i think the impression i kind of like the idea that john jurek becomes of almost david lynch style kind of director director sure but does but then does when marissa comes back for the other one or the no it's not called the other one it's called um the other one is what the other one is two of everything thank you yeah the other one is what the other one is called um the yeah two of everything shoot is and forgive me, it's it, it's been probably since like about February. Uh, outside of today, it's been about since like March since I've last like really d- dive deep into uh, these clips. Um, is she still possessed by the or is she still the one then or like does she bounce back and forth? Yeah, so I think from happens. from those clips, so the the frame back clips, cause you'll you'll find some of those are kind of where the one is just talking like almost talking heads, like she's been interviewed by someone's foreseen person. And this is where she's delivering exposition to fill the gaps of something. And the narrative of the behind the scenes stuff is that I think in the, in the mid to late nineties, Arthur Fisher, who's the director of Ambrosio, um, was like dying, like, like a terminal illness. So he was dying of, so he was dying and was going around doing a kind of a, like a personal apology to, apology tour of certain people and he got and so Arthur Fisher goes to meet John Jurek and apologizes for never releasing Ambrosio and gives Jurek the film reels of Ambrosio and so so yeah so then what so then the impression being is that the one starts re-watching these clips sees Marissa and remembers and then thinks oh I need to bring back Marissa because the impression the impression being that she can actually go back and she, she can morph back into a previous possessees. Okay. So that, that, that clip is why I don't know the answer to that. Okay. Yeah. See, and that's, that's what we're saying. Like I spent hours playing this game. There's a lot of things to unlock and like, there's a lot of layers to what's going on, the, the, the story within the story. And it really rewards that sense of, uh, you know, th- that, that, exploration it gives yeah. you that sense of discovery yeah but it's so so in the third film um where no what when none of the cast comment on the fact that marissa marcel hasn't aged in 30 years um <laughs> um so you get the so you've got john and marissa kind of john marissa but marissa is very subdued she, she's she's nowhere near as lively or as flirty or as kind of creative as she was in the previous two she's kind of just like there just doing the bare bones, almost distant, almost crazily depressed, more or less. Um, you got Jurek. And there are times where, so Marissa starts having spells where she's fainting or forgetting lines. Bloody noses. Yes. Yeah. yeah. People, people are constantly complaining that John Jurek is not on set. And the impression being is that she's struggling to be two people at once. Um, one of the very, one of the, one of the very key things and, which I never, I never got until it was pointed out in Reddit, and I had to go back and check. There are moments in you get quite, quite a few um, script reading scenes in in all of the films. You get quite a lot of them in the Two of Everything, where you got the cast and you got Jurek and Marissa. You got Amy Archer. You've got um, the guy. You got the guy who plays one of the main, 
one of the main guys. I can't remember who the name is on my head. Um, and they're, and they're going through scripts. And, um, what happens is that if you rewind, you're, you've got John and you've got Marissa, but then when you go back and reverse, you've just got the one sat where Marissa sat, but, and, and they're, and they're doing the exact same scenes. But then if you go back, what you'll find is that when Marissa turns a page for the script, Jurek does the exact same thing. So a lot of the actions that are happening are happening at the <sighs> same time. Um, Fuck, that's clever. Yeah. Um, and I, I'm back to see that. And like, you'll see that like there's the bit where they sat, sat down and like Jurek and like, so it's Amy Archer. So you got Amy Archer, um, who's play who plays a much bigger role than you expect um and you got marissa and you got john and like several times they'll go flick through pages and they're mirroring each other's and it's and that's that's great stuff and it's it's again once you know it's one of those things particularly when you know what's going on you go back revisit right. you're thinking you're picking all this yeah. stuff up yeah that's the thing is you, you will go back and and see like you will discover layers that aren't even necessarily these under layers but but knowing what's going on underneath reveals yet another thing that you didn't even realize was there on the surface. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, so yeah, but basically as kind of the one starts to kind of feel the pressure of profession, and I think trying to be both, trying to be both people kind of fails. There's a moment where she kind of collapses, collapses. You find one of her co, co-stars, Amy Archer, who we find out actually is the other. Yeah, the other. And the only reason that she's the other was that she actually saw the death of, she saw the death of um, Carl Green was from the Minsky reels. So, and so the impression being is that if you witness the death of a muse, you are then without dying are susceptible to being controlled. So, and that's how, that's how the that's how the Amy Archer character from Two of Everything becomes the other. Um, so as you start gathering all these things, you then get to the final, like chrono- chronologically, the final clip of the game, which which scared the hell out of me. Where you suddenly see Marissa Marcel sat, you see Amy Archer say uh, say like with a, a clapperboard, douse her with petrol, and then burn it to death. Right. And you just yeah. Right. So that that goes to like to an example of the kind of disturbing imagery that we talked about being in this game without it necessarily being a horror game. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think the, and the horror ending the show goes those as well is that as as Marissa Marcel burns, if you rever- reverse back, you then see the other do the same with the one, because the idea being is that they're very tough to kill, but fire may burn them. The, the fire kind of burns burns them or revitalizes them or something that's never fully clear but then you keep going back going back further and then suddenly the one after being burned becomes the blonde woman again starts getting closer and closer and closer looks at you the player and goes i see you then the game close so the impression being is that the person who's looking at these footage will become the next host so we the player are now the next host for the one and that's how the game ends so uh, <laughs> it's a uh, fascinating. Yeah, it is. I, uh, I I I talking to you just makes me want to go back in and like unlock all the little all the little things I missed. Um, you yeah, because I got I'd say you know eighty percent of it, but there's clearly some details of like the underlying story that I just missed here that you because you've seen every clip have you know have, and I think that is. You know, it's it's to the game's credit. It also definitely scratches that if you are a completionist, like this is your game. Like you will absolutely be rewarded for tracking down every little thing that's in the game. It's not just a matter of, you know, checking off boxes. You're actually like learning about the game as you discover. Exactly. And I think what happens as well is... Um, I think when you start getting into that, you start to actually start seeing that the actual individual films themselves are mirroring the journey of the one and the other one. I found myself enjoying the tube everything. I quite liked um, the kind of lo-fi cable drama aspect of it. <laughs> I found it. Quite- I I get that. For me, that was I think what I I think that was what put up a little bit of a barrier to me is it it, it, like of the three, it just looked the most kind of like 
digital late 90s, which is exactly the look they're going for. It's just not a look I'm as interested in. And and tonally, too, that was the one that I felt like of of the three, I felt like the maybe it was the writing, maybe it was the performance, something about the third one wasn't wasn't clicking for me as much as the other two. And that's not to say that it was bad. It wasn't. But if I'm comparing, um, that one was probably my least favorite. (laughs) Yeah, um, in, interesting enough, um, I've seen quite a few interviews with Man Engage. Man Engage being the actress who plays Marissa Marcel, um, and she says that she she absolutely loved Minsky. She loved filming Minsky, and she and that if there was any film that she would love to have <laughs> finished properly, she would love to have finished and done Minsky, which is which yeah, which um, which is fair enough. And um, but if we got but the so the first one I think Ambrosio. Um, which is the 1960s one um is is actually a adaptation of a an 18th century late 18th century novel called the monk um so and which i think really helps because when i was when I, when I was playing the game um when i was reading into it i ended up reading the monk has actually got a a a, a synopsis on wikipedia um, which helped me understand the film, the story, that story quite a lot. Um, interestingly enough as well, there's, um, there's a whole set, it's actually two plot lines. So you've got the Ambrosia Monk plot line and you've got a second plot line with, um, a sister, uh, the, a woman called Agnes who appears in about three clips. And right. I think in the film, that was the, achie- that was the achievement I unlocked before I got on with you as, yeah. as I got the, the Agnes achievement. <laughs> yeah i think the and i think you got sam barlow's kind of like kind of commentary on each thing and one of them is saying she was my favorite part of the book yes um, yeah that's what yeah. the achievement says yeah yeah and i think because and i think this is a quite an interesting indictment uh, in, interesting kind of like realistic thing as well is that you've got this adaptation of this novel and they completely ignore half of it because it's a separate plot line and they focus on the ambrosio story so uh the plot of the monk and which is actually quite faithful um, from what I can gather in the film is that it features this um, monk called Ambrosio. Uh, Ambrosio who meets, um, who has a friend called, he kind of sees, he kind of develops a friendship with this small, this like a uh, young male kind of monk who turns, who reveals herself to actually be a woman who is eventually revealed to be the devil who is played by Marissa Marcel. And then what happens is then the devil, yeah, I think, uh, I'm trying to remember the name. Yeah, Matilda, so refers to herself as Matilda. And Matilda kind of starts kind of putting kind of like darker thoughts in his, in his, um, in his, uh, in his ear, like into his brain. So there's a, there's a kind of woman and a, a woman's young daughter who kind of Ambrosio gets obsessed with and Matilda's encouraging him to try and take her and all this kind of weird things and it gets to the point where there's a kind of darkness like the encourage of like encouraging this per like encouraging Ambrosio to do these kind of dark very irrehensible uh acts like kidnapping drugging murder rape and kind of corrupting his soul kind of basically corrupting his soul to the point that at the end of the film Matilda kind of just says yeah you've done all this stuff I'm taking you to hell now um this kind of like gothic horror type stuff which is kind of mirroring, which kind of mirrors the kind of idea that a kind of inverse of what the one wants to do with Jurek. So Right. Yeah. And you have a an immortal being playing this fictionalized version of another immortal being who is also manipulating humanity behind the scenes and for very different purposes, but all, but but ultimately for their own purposes. I mean, like whatever Satan's motivations may be in a particular story, like th- this, the the one and and the other one, like they have their own motivations for manipulating events as they as they choose fit. So it's a it's kind of a fitting role for them to play. Yeah, but I, I quite I like, or this is my view, my kind of interpretation of it is that I think the one was drawn to the story because she probably feels different or the polar opposite to what's happening so rather than encouraging someone to embrace the darker aspects on actual people but to be able to 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 
encourage the storytelling, storytelling, um, and embracing those, those elements of storytelling so that you're not causing harm on people, but you are expressing the creativity of those secret desires of people. And that's what the muses are doing. Um, yeah, muses are doing and the quote and the kind of that layering of that story, I think is really quite well. Um, and this was some, so, um, any highlights, so any highlights of the scenes, any kind of memorable moments that jumped out to you during Ambrosio? Um, during Ambrosio itself, um, not as much because I think I was still, especially at that point in the game, trying to figure out what's going on, what am I doing, the mechanics. And so I was probably a little less focused on, which perhaps I shouldn't have been, on my enjoyment of each particular clip, you know, that that, that was coming across. I mean, I I liked some of the... Um, uh, the scenes where the undercutting of the director by the actress and the director of photography, like I liked that drama as that began to emerge. So any of those scenes where they're just kind of like figuring out how to, it's also like the, the film nerd in me. Like I liked the scenes where it was like the nitty gritty of like, let's figure out how to make this a good scene from an acting perspective, from a directing perspective, from like, how are you? Like I liked the scenes where they were figuring out how to make a good movie that really spoke to me. Yeah. And I think there's particularly interesting with that is that how different Marissa is from the start to the mm-hmm. end. I mean, yes. One, one of the first yeah. things, one of the first things you kind of see chronologically is, um, and I think it's one of the first ones you get, one of the first clips you get is the audition scene where she, where she kind of like is very quite headstrong and headstrong and kind of caters to, this kind of caters to everything that Arthur Fisher, Arthur Fisher does. He, you only see off screen. So he's, she, whereas you'll get, you see other people's auditions and they do the kind of stereotypical things, but then Marissa kind of starts quoting poetry, which Arthur Fisher kind of um, reacts to. He says quite a few sexist comments. Um, you then get, you get, then you start seeing the initial read throughs of scenes early on in the production. And she's just quiet. She doesn't really get involved in discussions and I think this is before John Jurick gets involved. Um Arthur Fisher constantly makes kind of sexist comments about the script, about the female members of the cast. She doesn't really say anything. Um if you go back and if you go back and reverse the audition scene um very early on, you get to the point where she actually morphs into the one and this is the this is the part this is the bit where I'm, I'm quite this is part I'm quite interested to get your thoughts of. There are some elements of this, including the scene, which where which I, I don't know whether they're actually canon or if they're thoughts, because very early on in the reverse scene, what you get, you get the one, go off screen, drag Arthur Fisher, put a knife to his throat and tells and tells him to stop being sexist and stop making yeah, and that that he's actually quite a horrible human being. But then I don't th- I, I don't know whether that's her mindset or not. I don't know. If, there's a couple of times where that happens. I don't know if was, is that what you think or is that i i yeah because i'm a little unclear on exactly the extent of their powers when it when it comes to their ability to influence other people that they're not actively influencing in the moment so i don't know i my read on that was it was a internal process that it wasn't a literal like i'm going to do this um maybe they do have that power but i didn't get the sense that i'd have to go back and look at the clips like that take place after that like whether there's any sense of like his behavior changing it's it's possible that it did i i think most the most of that stuff was like front loaded in the auditions and rehearsals um so it's possible that he changed as a result of that influence it's possible that it was just an internal thought i i didn't really have a sense um one way or the other but my my first impression was that it was um uh, going on in their head yeah because i think on some of the reverse of those script read through scenes there's like if you go in the reverse then there's everyone's naked and the actor playing ambrosio is 
basically having sex with, I don't think it's Marissa, I think it's the actress who plays Sophia. Or I think Sophia is the, yeah, Sophia is the actress who's playing Antonia. Um, yeah, so there's, so yeah, so I don't, yeah, so there's those moments like that, which is kind of weird, kind of weird, kind of visuals. Um, and one of several moments to have nudity in it. Um, there's a lot, <laughs> yeah, there is a lot of nudity in this game. <laughs> which oh yeah, yeah there is yeah but um it's don't play it, this game on a train yes <laughs> i learned <laughs> i didn't know i didn't read the content warning <laughs> yeah well, next clip next clip yes yeah we'll, it, we'll look at that one later it, it's made <laughs> weather's not a person next to me it's made some of the twitch dreams quite interesting including twitch screams where man engage herself has been playing the game and she's been interviewing members of the cast um because i've seen quite a few of them as well um yeah so it'd be like playing oh no 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 reverse 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 <laughs> um right yeah um yeah but yeah so there's but there's that kind of element to things as well um but yeah, and I th- there is. I think yeah, there's um, quite a few interesting moments in that. Like for example, there's like a few times where, a few times where um, you reverse back, and next thing you know, the one is stabbing um, Robert, who's the actor playing Ambrosio, playing Ambrosio. Or there's there's bits where you see a painting of. I can't remember what the. I can't remember what the painting's supposed to be of, but then it's but then in universe it's painted like Man and Gage slash Marissa, and then if you reverse that painting changes, and it's right. yeah, and it's just kind of really weird off kilter, and there's also a couple of times which go very quite strange where there's the actor playing Lucifer turns out to be the other as well, um, yeah, so but yeah, I think um, and around that time as well, I think. I think I've seen people kind of talk about the the picture quality uh, being oh it's a bit too clean for 1960s, but I've always I've always seen it as it feels as if someone's taken the film and done a Blu-ray remaster of the yeah. footage. Um, yeah, I mean and- it doesn't have the the grain that you would expect in 68 or 70 in those. It feels like I think that you're right. It looks a lot more like someone cleaned it up like it was production designed and lit like it was of that era but in terms of like the actual like film stock that would have been used it looks like it's been removed of all grain which if this was actual like actually like a blu-ray a blu-ray master of these movies people would be pissed about people would be like this doesn't look right this you know so like in in that sense like i think it's kind of a valid criticism because like even if you look at it as like hey it's remastered like it shouldn't be remastered to this extent (laughs) um but 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 i but i think you're right like it's a game it's it, like everyone i think understands that like it's more about about evoking like the feel of the era and like i said i think they do a lot of that through costuming styling acting production design they're doing all of these other things and even writing style like all these other things to make it feel of the era the fact that they can't nail that one visual component is something i can forgive yeah, what I found quite there's a, there's a nice kind of like counterbalance to that argument that people have made in that there's there's not many and I kind of wish there was more instances of old to, old style interview shows. So there's there's about two I think there's two clips, one from 1968 and one from 1970 of a of a late night talk show. Um like a talk show where you've got Marissa Marcel and then John Jurich talking in, I think in the sixties, you've got Marissa talking about filming Ambrosio and you actually see, cause, cause it feels like it's a, a VHS, like a VHS recording. You've got a very low quality recording of the chat show. Then you see one of the scenes that you see in like quality, in perfect quality on film being played on this VHS and the, and the quality and the same quality is really low quality. So this is the kind of like, played VHS to death star quality. So you can kind of see so I think that I think that's kind of to reiterate the point that what you're seeing is the film 
is the actual film reels rather than just so like rather than just VHS copies of it. So I think I think that counteracts the the quality question. But um, yeah, and you know, it, it, it's like sure, could we have thrown on some like extra filters on a couple of these? Fine, M- maybe whatever. Um, it certainly doesn't detract from the game. Yeah, definitely. And if anything, if anything, I, uh, it to me, it's like there's a nice kind of like Blu-ray remaster kind of thing. But I think stylistic wise, the, the, the camera choices and stuff t- are like full on. Like you, uh, you, uh, you could probably convince someone that they were filmed during that time. Um, if we move on to Minsky, um, Minsky is at nineteen seventies. It's filmed in New York, and I think there's a lot of lot on location shooting. Um, and the, the idea being is that, uh, give me a second. Yeah. So yeah. So the story of Minsky is about the death of, as I said earlier, the death of an artist, and this police officer, this police detective, gets involved in the muse of this artist who he believes might actually have killed might have killed uh this like creative like this creative uh this artist and gets dragged down into like kind of like his kind of traditional traditionalist conservative kind of viewpoint viewpoint so he gets he gets taken to like um this bohemian art culture i think he gets dressed up in high heels and puts my and he's put my and then he's made to put Michael up on and goes into this bar and i think starts to have feelings towards this muse as well who might be who might actually be the killer he's after um yeah which could again contrasting with the fact that there's the other posing as posing as the, the actor playing um the actor playing uh the the police officer the parallels are quite there as are there as well, but I think stylistic and I said stylistically around stylistically Minsky feels like it's in the seventies. It feels kind of like I think you said like it probably is the high point of the of the game, and kind of sets is I think in in, in terms of the actual story, it's where the the kind of more important aspects of the story goes in terms of understanding the mythology of and the relationship between the one and the other one. Um, yeah, but there's, there's a lot to quite like in the Minsky stuff. So you said it, so you said it was your favorite out of the three. Um, mm-hmm. why was that? I think part of it definitely had to do with style and the fact that I think that is where for me, like I really started to sink my teeth into the game. Like I know I didn't, technically get the reveal of the the deeper layer until you know the um the 99 movie but for me minsky was like as a movie in it of itself was the one that kind of like started to draw me in like ambrosia was like interesting but like minsky i i like was getting like pretty drawn into like what was going on story-wise piecing together at, at at one point i was wondering to myself like oh my god am i gonna like piece together this whole goddamn movie uh you know because because there's so much there and that was also the point in the game when i think i was getting most excited about realizing just like how much there was to discover so i think all of that um played into why minsky for me felt um like my favorite i think too like like i mentioned earlier the 99 one like the the style the look the 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 performances the writing like it was just for me just not working on the same level as was the case with minsky there was also i loved all the like rehearsals and behind the scenes footage like i felt like we got so much more of that um and 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 much more interesting dynamic rehearsals you know because of the different directing styles um when we were uh working with the Minsky clips and when we were working with the Ambrosio clips yeah i think with Ambrosio you've got the particularly around that time and how hollywood used to film stuff where you had like the idea that it was all on a kind of a, a kind of three walled set so so you like it there wasn't a fourth wall, whereas there's a lot more on location shooting with film with Minsky. Um, there's a lot more of the behind the scenes thing, as you said, where you've got Marissa being quite flirty with um, Carl Greenwood, who's 
Carl Goodman, not Greenwood. Um, Carl Goodman, the actor playing the detective. Who, the detective name, detective name is blanking on me at the moment. But um, yeah, so you've got Marissa being quite cl- getting quite close with that Carl character, um, who will event who she then discovers is the other. Anyway, you you get a lot more of the freedom to be herself or or at least Marissa Marcel as the one being herself and encouraging encouraging just the creativity and getting this actor out of the, sh- out of the shell because you get the impression that Carl Goodman the actor had shares if before she revealed before she realizes who he is you get the impression that Carl Goodman is someone who's kind of conservative and very similar to his character that he plays in Minsky and you kind of see Marissa Marcel getting him out of his shell at the same time, which links to the idea that those muses are getting, sharing quite a lot of the personalities of their hosts as well. Um, but yeah, you get quite a lot of the imperial stage of Marissa Marcel's kind of persona. Um, and it's quite nice to see, kind of to see that develop as well as it just, yeah, like it felt, it feels like it's a, it was a fun shoot to be on. <laughs> yeah. And I think what, what also made it, appealing to me was because I had already gone through a lot of the Ambrosia stuff and had seen that transition that Marissa went through as a character from being the more, the like the less certain, the less secure in her skills to being, you know, like by the time we get to Minsky, she is like in the full bloom of her confidence and her creative power. And that is compelling to watch too. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, yeah. And I think it's kind of just great to kind of see this kind of on-screen presence. And I think, I think perhaps the idea, because the, the game tries to sell you, tell you, and I think it does, that what, what you're seeing is this lost, this lost, um, like icon of 60s, 70s cinema. Um, I'm trying to think, I'm trying to think off the top of my head of a real world analog. Um, and I can't think off the top of my head. Um, of someone who, of an actress around that time. Uh, I want to say Jane Fonda, but I don't know if. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Someone, sure. like J- someone like Jane Fonda or something, or someone who, like who, who kind of then like steps up after like an art, like has their kind of breakthrough role and then starts doing kind of, and then eventually start doing these kind of interesting independent films and stuff, independent films and stuff like that. And yeah, and you get the impression that, you get the impression that you're seeing someone who, it, it like, re- removed of any of the knowledge of the, the supernatural element and just trying to figure out what happened to this actress. Like you're seeing the tragedy of this, of this star in the making because to complete, to man en- and we've not really spoken about man engaged as an actress yet. Um, because this is, cause it's an absolute fantastic performance and perhaps, perhaps one of the best, perhaps one of the best, if not the best performance in a full motion video game ever. Um, I mean, I, I don't know what the competition would be, but as far as I'm concerned, she's won it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you've basically got an actress playing, Man Engage playing someone, playing someone, playing someone, and doing it to and doing it to a point where, if this was an actual film, you could have seen this. You could have seen this like actress gone on to doing all sorts of stuff and getting all these accolades um, and feeling as if you're looking at a lost, a lost star or someone who's robbed of like, like, or at least the world being robbed of this, for lack of a better word, um, star getting immortality in film. So like where you've got these, where you've got people from the sixties and seventies who are going to be immortalized forever in film, like your Audrey Hepburn, your Michael Caine's, your, your, Charles and Heston's, uh, Richard Burton's, um, those kind of like actors that was in that, in that era, like they will forever be on screen and they'll never die because of these films. You're seeing that. He, he, Minsky is the film which showcases that M- Marissa Marcel should have been someone alongside those names, immortalized forever, but. <laughs> in comparison to the name of the actual game, kind of their career, like her career died for mysterious reasons. And I think that, uh, I think the game, particularly in this, at this stage of the kind of the world of immortality, just 
manages to set that kind of concept perfectly. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. And, um, and the name of the game, you know, immortality, it's obviously like, it's a theme, you know, we have these literal immortal muses, but we all, we also have these, and admittedly, like they're, they're controlling, possessing, whatever it is they're doing, but you know, the, even if they weren't, you know, the idea of, you know, these people immortalizing themselves through their creative work is something that clearly resonates with at least one of these immortal creatures too. Yeah. And again, the idea, and I think the idea of immortality as I was alluding to, as I was saying earlier, that on screen, you've got figures that will never die. Okay. Like Clark Gable, um, Jimmy Stewart, um, other names I'm currently blanking on because I'm not hundred percent a film guy from that period, but, um, like from the thirties, the forties, Charlie Chaplin, like, like still culturally relevant, still constantly brought up, still will be shown alongside, like every, like alongside people from years to come. Like you'll keep going back to all these films in the past because these characters are going to be immortalized forever on the silver screen. You're going to have these classics constantly be pumped back onto screens in cinemas. Um, and I think, and I think that's like interesting that you've got an immortal being wanting to be more playing someone who wants to be immortalized in that film as well. Um, so immortality, not just a clever name, a very clever name. <laughs> but yeah, so the, um, so the story itself, so the story itself, again, we mentioned that because you've got the death of, you've got the death that happens on set, which is actually not, which was a deliberate, like, murder. Right. It wasn't the accidental, you know, situation that it seemed to be the tragedy that it seemed to be mm. at first. So, yeah, and then which leads to the two of everything, which, again, I could probably go on for hours and hours about. But yeah, I think Mincy is the masterpiece, like the kind of masterpiece on that. Um, we've spoken, yeah, we've spoken about, I can't rave about this game enough. This game is an experience in of itself. Um, in of itself. If you, if you, if, some, if you've somehow got to this point and not played it, I, I'm surprised. Uh, what, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. What, what are you doing? And hey, look, thanks for listening if that's the case, but also go play this game. Yes. Yeah. And if you play, and if you play this game, um, I hope, we, I hope we just rem- reminded you why you should get other people to play this game. Um, so yeah, it's, yeah. Cause I, I think us talking about like the different thing, I mean, I know for me, like I said earlier, like I, I've clearly missed a few things and now I want to go back and, and re-explore and dig back into it. And like I was saying earlier, if, if you are a completionist, if you are someone who likes to do every last little thing in the game and explore all the game secrets, this game is going to be very rewarding. Yeah. Um, in terms of reception, it's done really well. It's got uh, 87 out of 100 on Metacritic, but then it's got 9 out of 10 on uh, Destructoid. You're a game recommended it. Game Spot 8 out of 10. Games ra- Radar 4 out of 4.5 out of 5. PC Gamer 95 out of 10. The Guardian 5 out of 5. Edge gave it a 10 out of 10 score, and it's the 24th game in its history to do so. And Edge has been around for absolutely forever, um, since 1993. So, yeah, the 24th game that Edge has ever done. Um, it's won so many, it's won and been nominated and won awards. It was, Man and Gage has won quite a few awards already um yeah she won a golden joystick for best performer uh best acting in a game on the new york game awards it's won excellence in narrative and independent games festival narrative awards for the for, um for the british academy games awards which i think i think it, i think that's the baftas um yeah and it's been nominated for other stuff as well and it's just you'll understand why in terms of just how it managed to, to tell a story on so many different layers and in a non-chronological way um yeah it's, i just find it amazing so um any brief thoughts that we might have missed that you want to quickly bring up you know no i think we really covered the game in depth i think everyone has a sense of why we liked it and of of the story and and what we liked exploring about it again you know we, we didn't get as much into the conversation about whether or not this counts as a game and i i just did briefly want to touch on that because I think that a 
it is. Um, it is a little bit different in that the gameplay itself is discovering how to play the game and what the game's about. Like the, you know, the reason why we couldn't go into that much detail before getting to spoilers is that discovering everything is the game, is the gameplay. You have that rich sense of discovery as you're going through and exploring and clicking and yada, yada, yada. And just because there isn't, a, you know, a quest log or a list of objectives that you're trying to complete a boss you're trying to battle, anything like that, doesn't take away from the fact that while you're playing this game and playing around with these clips, for me, I found it very engaging, very fun. There's clearly more still yet to discover, and there's a story here, and a story that it is it is up to the player to determine how much uh, of it they unlock and how much of it that they discover, and that's that's a, a, a really powerful gameplay mechanic for me. Might not speak to everyone, but for me, it definitely worked as a game and a piece of interactive storytelling. Yeah, no, I completely agree. And I think that's probably the best way to end end that chat, Ian. Um, thank you so much for coming on to Ask Us About Loom again. Um, it's always been... Thanks as always for having me. Yeah, it's always a pleasure to have you back on. And we'll, we'll probably get you back on for later on in the year at some point. Um, if people want to find you, where can they find you online? Um, not super on social media, but I am elsewhere on the network on We Are Starfleet, our Star Trek Strange New Worlds podcast, The Way, our Star Star Wars podcast, uh, Illumination Above All, our Severance podcast, and I pop up on Movieversaries and some other shows as well. So you can hear me elsewhere on the network. Just type in my name on any of our, our We Made This uh, network streams and you can find the episodes where I pop up. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. And you can find us on Ask Us About Loom on instagram and or twitter um ask us about loom at gmail.com if you want to email any thoughts and yeah so that is the end of our chat with immortality and i think this is probably the last special i'm going to get until hopefully season two begins airing in september um ian thank you ever so much again and again i can't thank you enough and for people listening i want to please subscribe like follow whatever right tell everyone tell your friends tell your parents tell your cat about listening to this podcast um and i'll hopefully see you all again soon so take care if i asked you to think about japanese movies what do you picture anime no doubt you think of the beautifully rendered works of studio ghibli maybe you picture godzilla and his coterie of city ravaging kaiju Perhaps you see Toshido Mifune wandering the countryside and armed with only his wit and his blade. And I know you're trying not to think about the pale-faced ghost with long hair and creepy noises. And maybe you're a fan of the exploitation type of cinema, where schoolgirls wield chainsaws and machine guns with abandon. My name's Perry Constantine. I'm an author and a teacher, and back when I was in college, I had the exact same image of Japanese films as you did. It was my love and interest in these movies that led me to move to Japan. Now, almost 20 years later, I'm still here and teaching classes about Japanese film. What I've learned in that time is that Japanese movies are so much more diverse than just anime or kaiju or samurai. Sure, those movies are fun, but by exploring the wide range of Japanese cinema, there's so much we can learn about Japanese history, society, and culture. That's why I started Japan on Film. In each episode, I'm joined by a different guest to help me spotlight just some of these excellent movies. We'll be watching the good, the bad, the popular, and the bizarre. Come along with us on a journey into the wide, wonderful, and sometimes very weird world of Japanese cinema. Listen to the Japan on Film podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts, and visit our website, japanonfilm.com.